Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania Health System have come up with a new approach to treat cancer. By using your own immune system, they create a vaccine that can kill cancer cells and keep them from coming back. Early breast cancer starts with cancer cells in the ducts. And it's, it's something called ductal carcinoma in situ. There's, there's not much difference between a tumor cell and a normal cell, but there are some differences. For example, some tumor cells overexpress, overproduce proteins that, that actually help them grow and divide. For example, one of these proteins is, is one called HER2 NU, and that's an acronym. It stands for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor 2. It's a normal protein in your body that normally should not be on in your breast cells, but in the case of this particular cancer, it gets overexpressed. So it means it's being produced, too much of it's being produced, and it's causing the cancer to begin. If you're here to know overexpressing, you're more likely to have invasive disease. The disease is more likely to spread, become metastatic, and it has a tendency to be resistant to certain frontline chemotherapies. Chemotherapy is designed to kill rapidly dividing cells. In some cases with the newer so-called targeted therapies, it may also be designed to block specific proteins or met metabolic pathways within cancer cells. But unfortunately, none of these treatments are completely specific to the tumor, and therefore there may be toxic effects, and some chemotherapy can be extremely toxic. Vaccines offer the hope of designing a treatment that really is specific to a patient's tumor, which would not affect normal tissues, and hopefully would be less toxic and also more effective. One or two percent of all patients that have a cancer may spontaneously cure themselves of their tumor, even though it's never been removed, and they can be alive 10 or 15 years later and with no evidence of cancer. And in that setting, it's reasonably clear that their own immune system has taken care of their cancer. The problem in cancer immunology is that we haven't quite figured out how to get everybody's immune system to do that. The primary goal of the immune system is to, is to distinguish what we call self-tissue from infectious non-self. Infectious non-self being like microbes, germs. The real reason why we have an immune system isn't to deal with cancer, it's to deal with infection. What we wanted to do was trick the immune system into believing that what it was doing was combating an infection rather than cancer. We give a vaccine made from the patient's own white blood cells that we activate out of their body with some components that tell the immune system this protein is bad like a virus or like a bacteria and then that will direct your immune system to go attack the cancer cells. Really what a cancer cell is, it's, it's like a normal cell but it, 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 its growth is completely dysregulated. It's almost like a car that has the accelerator pedal stuck to the floor. It's constantly growing, it's constantly dividing, it's constantly going to new places, and when it, when it grows and forms tumors, it disrupts normal tissue, and this is what eventually leads, leads to, to, to problems. Surgery, I would expect, is nearly as effective in eradicating tumors as it is going to be. It's getting that last cell or the last few cells that have gotten away when you remove this mass of tumor cells that's critical. And I think that's where vaccine strategies offer so much excitement that if we can simply eliminate those last few stray cells that have gotten away from the main tumor and remove the main tumor mass, we will cure many more patients. Currently we have a clinical trial on for people with early breast cancer. So either very early invasive breast cancer or ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a pre-malignant lesion. We treat them with the vaccines before they do any surgery to see what the effect is of the vaccines on the tumor when we take out what's left uh, after the vaccinations. In our first phase one, phase two trial, we treated 27 patients with ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast, which is an early pre-invasive breast cancer. Of these patients, five of them uh, when we sent them to surgery after vaccination actually had no detectable disease left. Of the remaining 22, uh, approximately half of those, I think 11 patients, uh, their levels of HER2 new, which was the target protein in the vaccine, declined virtually, uh, most of them virtually to nothing. We have patients that five years later still have a very strong immune response in their blood against HER2 new, suggesting that's continuing to protect them long term chemotherapy and radiation, most of their effects happen quickly and then there's no longer any protection once the chemotherapy has been removed from the body.
Among the problems with chemo, most standard chemotherapies is they suppress the immune system. Uh, whereas the goal of a vaccine is to augment the immune system to help the immune system to kill the cancer cells. The side effects of vaccination are very minimal. It, it's generally uh, you have flu-like symptoms in, in for a few hours after vaccination, headache, fever, and this sort of thing. When you compare it to what you go through with chemotherapy or radiation therapy, it's really much less. Most vaccines that are given against a disease, especially infectious disease, they're given in a prevention mode. So. If you vaccinate against a pathogen or, or a bacteria, you're giving it to prevent a particular infection. In cancer, because the, the tumor is already present, we're doing um, vaccines in a treatment mode as opposed to trying to prevent. However, over time, if you come up with the right uh, immune responses and the right targets on a cancer, you may be able to use it in a prevention setting. But in cancer, we're not there at prevention yet. We're working towards a goal where, um, where vaccine therapy or immunotherapy is the first line of defense against cancer, and, and the other therapies follow on after that. I think the biology, the understanding of the biology in the vaccine work, the understanding of how to stimulate the immune system, what antigens on tumors are effective in stimulating an immune response that will kill the cancer cells. We're, we're there with many of those things in the laboratory. It, it's taken many years to get there, but as we now try to translate that work and move it from the bench to the bedside, that involves a whole additional series of challenges. And with those challenges, uh, most of the questions have to be answered in clinical trials. And clinical trials mean treating patients. It's a tremendous opportunity to take cancer patients and actually offer them the very best and latest treatments, something that wasn't available as even a few months ago. At the same time, there's a substantial expense to that. It costs about $5,000 to make a set of anywhere from four to eight vaccines per patient. We receive funding from the National Cancer Institute that covers part of those charges. However, there's a lot of other patient costs, such as uh, breast MRIs, lab work, um, chest x-rays that need to be covered in the clinical trial that we have to raise additional money for it to cover for the patients. Conventional healthcare insurance does not pay for research. So a patient who's getting a breast cancer vaccine cannot uh, have their insurance pay for that vaccine until that becomes a standard treatment. So as long as that's a clinical trial, a, a treatment in evolution, it has to be paid for by research funds. What we're looking for in the future, in the very near future, is to gain the funds to do a, a large multi-center phase three trial. And something like that where we'd be treating uh, between 100 and 200, and perhaps even a bit more than 200 patients, would, uh, would probably run uh, in the order of uh, five to $10 million. We need the facilities to be able to manufacture um, vaccines to be made and shipped to different centers around the country. We have um, formed actually a company to be able to do that. The infrastructure is here to be, to be able to conduct such a trial, but we w would need a, a company behind us. And, and that, the resources may take anywhere from 10 to $15 million to set up the corporation to be able to manufacture these vaccines. The clinical trial part of it would cost about five to $10 million. So it's not, it's not a trivial amount of money. And one of the problems is it, the National Institutes of Health is not really big on funding these kind of very large trials. They tend to fund smaller to medium-sized trials. So, so it really is very difficult to find a source that, that, that's going to be able to supply the, the, the kind of funds for that, that sort of large trial that's necessary to actually prove uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt that, that the therapy is actually extending the lives of cancer patients. I don't think we could start designing therapies by how much they could cost. I think we have to design effective therapies and then worry about how much it's going to cost and how we can reduce costs afterwards. If we went around to try to cure people of cancer and worried about what the cost would be, we probably wouldn't have very many drugs at all. The pace of research is a little bit unpredictable, but it's very clear we're advancing faster and more effectively now than we have at any point in the history of cancer research. Uh, the treatments that we have now are radically different in many cases from those we had even a few years ago. 
And there's little doubt that additional incremental benefit of funding now um, goes farther than it has at any other time. If we secure the funding, we'll, we will accelerate uh, discovery and we will be able to uh, move up to a point much more quickly where we can actually have a treatment that's, that we can deploy uh, to virtually any place in the country. If we continue to move along at the pace we're moving now, it may take 30 years to get um, through all these different trials to get it to the point of FDA. If we had instant funding at this point, we could probably move it into a five to ten year window to get this approved. This is why that we really need organizations like Pennies in Action, which can potentially fill the gap uh, that the federal government uh, does not fund currently. The reality is that even small donations from large numbers of people, which Pennies in Action has really been able to achieve in recent years, can go a long way towards providing additional funding that let us move scientific breakthroughs out to patients more rapidly and more effectively. What Pennies in Action does is they help support this research, so they've become a funding source to make this research progress much more quickly than if we had to just depend on government funding or funding from private foundations. And the great thing about Pennies in Action is that, that virtually every dollar you donate goes straight, straight to research. There's, no, um, there's very little overhead and, and it's all volunteers. I'd like to see a future where there was a world with no cancer, where someone could, could come in, either they had early cancer or they have a risk for developing uh, cancer from their family history or from known risk factors, where we could come up with a set of vaccines they could take to prevent them from getting cancer. And again, that's where Pennies in Action offers such an opportunity. The more funds you have, the more patients can be enrolled, the more trials you can do, uh, and the faster we can make progress uh, against cancer and, and uh, other related diseases. It's time for all of us to step up and offer our support. Let's not lose another life. Donations can be made at penniesinaction.org, at any TD Bank, by mailing a check to the address on the screen, or simply dropping change in any Pennies in Action jar at various locations. Please visit penniesinaction.org for more information on how you can help.